in a world where um, you know crypto is ubiquitous, what infrastructure is needed? What role do we play? I, I think in my mind that is that is a almost a certainty in terms of where I think the world will be. Money will be digital, and it will be centralized. Now it will be decentralized, and your bank account will look and smell and feel very different to what it does today. And, and how you interact with money will be very different too. that we are going to have a recession is more severe than the global financial crisis. We are looking at other available options. More and more people are buying and holding Bitcoin. 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 Let's take a look at Bitcoin. Some call this digital gold. Everybody should probably have 1% of their assets in Bitcoin. Dear crypto community and blockchain buddies across the globe, welcome back to Kryptonites, the no BS blockchain channel built with the community and for the community. And before we kick off, a big shout out to The Capital, Emil, for providing us with awesome content, awesome questions, so that we can provide these timeless interviews for you guys. And without further ado, we have a great guest today, CEO of Coinbase UK, Zishan. It's a pleasure to have you. Good to be here. So Zishan, I have first question, something that was really interesting that came uh, through the news recently was there was a Coinbase study saying that 60% of customers start with Bitcoin, but only 24% of those customers stick exclusively to Bitcoin and start actually venturing out to different altcoins and utility tokens. I would love to hear how you got into the crypto space and Bitcoin. Was it similar? Because I know that you kicked off with a traditional background in finance. Um, so, so this is an interesting story. I, I did kick off uh, my professional career in traditional finance. I, I, did, I spent over 10 years there. But actually, if we go a little further back, I, um, I have a master's in algorithm design and cryptography was one of the main subjects I studied in that back in 2005. So it, it's something that I was um, very keenly interested in way before Bitcoin was, was a thing. And I, I was just fascinated by the ability to hide stuff in plain sight um, and, and studied it back as part of my academic qualifications. And I worked in the financial services industry for you know most of my professional career. But when Coinbase came along, it was actually a great opportunity that, opportunity that uh, interest as well as what I invested my professional career in. So. Uh, it, it's not something that, that I thought would ever happen, that I'd be able to work for a crypto business, at least not when I was doing my degree. But uh, I, I'm super excited that I do get to do that now. That's so cool. And it makes a lot of sense as a transition, especially if you were studying algorithmic technology and also cryptography, which is really, really interesting. And if, if I may ask, like, are you more of a Bitcoin guy or do you see cryptocurrency as a new asset class? And what are your feelings and sentiment as of today? I, I'm definitely, um, so <laughs> this might not be the best answer, but I'm definitely both. I, I, I love Bitcoin for what it has ushered in for us in, in the sense that, you know, it, it gave the world uh, the, the technology that Money 2.0 is going to be built on. So it's special. Um, but whether I think Bitcoin itself will be the, the solution, you know, will be a money 2.0, I'm not sure. And I see it more as a an asset class. I, I, I see, I think the future that I, I envision 
it's it's probably one where you have a lot of currencies, a lot of digital currencies exist for different purposes. You'll have on one end of the spectrum, you'll have things like central bank, uh, central bank backed digital currencies. On the other end of the spectrum, you'll have something like Bitcoin. And and I think money will just become a more open, free market where, as a as an individual, I, I'll have the choice of where I store my value. And that could be based on my use cases. That could be based on monetary policy that that I um, believe in. Um, so, so I think ultimately there will be multiple winners. I I think Bitcoin will continue to have it, its place, uh, but the reality we live in will be interacting with a lot of uh, uh, digital currencies in the future. Very well said, Zishan. And speaking of which, uh, CBDC, so central bank digital currency, is something I would love to ask you about. But before that, uh, Coinbase was very successful at launching what we call USDC. And in terms of stable coins, it's kind of like these days, the cool stable coin is DAI because of the decentralized nature, but the trusted stable coin is often USDC. Why do you believe that most of the people believe that USDC is a trusted stable coin and have great faith into it as of today? So um, I, I think that to some extent uh, speaks to the investments we've made um, in the Coinbase brand in, in trying to establish ourselves as a, a trusted um, exchange, as trusted wallet provider. Um, we tend to operate in jurisdictions that we operate in. We tend to work very closely with regulators and governments to ensure that we build the right sort of sustainable business model. Um, but but that's that's really what the Coinbase philosophy is. Uh, USDC is is actually issued by a consortium called Center, and uh, Coinbase is a part of that. Um, but I think ultimately where the gap in the market was um, was for a stable coin that, as you say, is trusted, where you know that you know it's backed one to one by collateral. There's audits, um, and, and that's what we wanted to try and do is to give the community. A stable coin that you know um, is transparent and and they can be sure of is 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 fully backed 100% as as it's described. So it's actually a very simple solution. It, it's just a one to one pegged uh, cryptocurrency. So it, it's not a very tricky thing to do, but to maintain the infrastructure behind it to ensure that you have the on and off ramps, you have the minting and burning processes, uh, all of those are transparent. They're they're visible. Uh, I think that's where we invested the most uh, in, and you know, uh, the the fact that it's seen as a trusted stable coin, hopefully, is a is an outcome of the investment we've made in that infrastructure. That's really good, actually. Through our communities, we we did a survey on which is the most trusted uh, stable coin, and USDC was number one uh, many many times. Actually, every time we conducted that quick quiz or, or survey. So congratulations on that. Uh, in speaking of coins and tokens. Zishan, like what, what is really interesting is, I don't know if you remember, of, of course you remember, back in the day, every time a coin was about to get listed on Coinbase, there was suddenly a surge in price. And recently, uh, congratulations yeah. on getting Omisego, uh, which is a great project that currently listed is available on the Coinbase app, also had a similar impact. Actually, as a matter of fact, went up uh, approximately, I think, 150%. Um, these, these interesting like surges in prices, uh, we always wondered, like, how, why does it happen? Is it because Coinbase is a company that does really good due diligence, looks into the projects, and because you guys are very strong on the due diligence side and regulated, uh, people have that, you know, trust suddenly? Or is it because the U.S. residents or citizens are struggling to get access to other cryptocurrencies? I know you don't may not have the perfect answer for this, but why is it that these... Uh, projects get suddenly so much interest yeah I, I think that's um I think that's a difficult one to exactly attribute to one thing but I think you touched on a few things over there I I think one when we list an asset we we do a an extraordinary amount of due diligence on the asset the team behind it the roadmaps the technology um, we even back in 2017, I think we published the the asset listing framework that was a uh, list of criteria that you know that's evolved since then. But it was a starting point for the list of criteria that we look for in an asset. So I, I think it is that that rigor, that level of due diligence in the first place that we do around assets before we list them on the exchange. I, I think that probably has something to do with it. Um, the other thing is. 
I, I think it's about distribution as well. So an exchange has a certain type of audience, but a um, a retail app where you know you're not you're not playing with like market orders or, or limit orders. You simply you you want to buy BTC or you want to buy Ethereum, and, and you're given a price, and you simply go ahead and and click buy, and and, and it, it's as simple as that. We have amongst the largest distribution to retail customers through our retail proposition, uh, the simple buy and sell, and, and I think. Having uh, adding support for a coin on Coinbase gives exposure to that base, and and quite often it may be uh, the surge might be related to interest from that customer base who perhaps couldn't interact with that currency before. So um, you know that that's not to say that so the advanced traders and, and folks that are relatively um, sophisticated in approach to crypto would probably look for an exchange to trade on. Whereas for ourselves, I, I think the retail customers make up a big bulk of the volume, and that may have a role to play in in the price as well. I, I do want to say one thing though. Um, I don't think our role in terms of listings is is to be kingmaker in, in in terms of you know if we list it, we're endorsing an asset. What we want to do is ultimately let the community decide on, on what projects they interact with and how. But our responsibility is to ensure that we offer exposure to assets that meet a certain bar in, in terms of quality, and and, and that's really it. There isn't. Um, it's not discretionary beyond that in terms of what project we believe in or what project we don't believe in. So it's it's not it's not an endorsement, as you said. It's just they pass the due diligence, and, and for those reasons, I guess the Coinbase users uh, still need to do their own due, due diligence. But uh, obviously, it's maybe one obstacle in, in building trust, as you guys said. Um, so you touched upon a really interesting point earlier, which was central bank digital currencies. I would love to ask you, Zishan. Obviously, you have great knowledge on the U.S. You're based here in the U.K. Uh, so would love to talk to you or ask you about Brexit as well, which is a very interesting topic and how London may evolve here as some believe to be a crypto hub. But kicking off with central bank digital currencies, as you may know, there have been multiple concerns and jokes about the brr, the money printing machine um, and also the surge of the digital currency yuan, which money, many believe that may be a threat to the US dollar because also in China, they're not doing quantitative easing as strong as is happening in the US. What is your overall view on central bank digital currencies? Do you see the digital yuan as a threat? Do you think the US should accelerate or start creating a US digitized dollar as well? Um, so I'll come to the, the, the Chinese yuan part of the question later. I, I think if I, um, if I talk about central bank backed digital currencies, CBDCs uh, at a high level, um, I'm slightly controversial, but, but in my opinion, they're actually necessary to make this transition to money 2.0. And, and I, know, um, I know within the crypto community uh, that the sentiment is the, the central bank uh, the CBDC goes against all of the ethos of what you know, the decentralized economy stands for. Um, and, and I agree with that, but I, but I also think that the reality that we live in today is um, people aren't going to switch to a decentralized currency overnight. It, it's not, and we're not talking about you know pockets of enthusiasts. We're talking about absolute mainstream. We're talking about use on the London Underground. We're talking about you know your everyday salaries, utilities, or your everyday use cases. Um, so I, I, I don't see that happening without there being a big shift, a, a big institutional shift. And I, I think, in my mind, I think there's actually a couple of ways that might come about. Um, one of them is central bank uh, back digital currencies. I, I think when you're, you're starting to look at a, a digital dollar or a digital pound, what that would do is that, that would start a migration en masse to uh, digital currencies. And uh, many will transition over to a, a CBDC, which is, which is fine. But what it'll also do is the fact that money starts to go digital, what it'll also do is a lot of the infrastructure that's created around that will be reusable because, you know, they are relatively similar. So I think what will happen is it will inadvertently drive adoption of decentralized currencies because 
now people will be more comfortable and familiar with what with a digital currency and the, the leap from a five pound note to a bitcoin is much larger than a leap from a a crypto uh, digital pound to oh i can also store bitcoin in the same wallet that i keep my pounds in um that that leap is smaller so i think uh, cbdc's actually do the crypto community a service by uh, enabling that migration, um, which will ultimately lead to then more folks transitioning to decentralized currencies. Um, necessary one of the phrases to just, but it's, 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 I think, in the, to the utopia, I think it is a, a, a step and, and quite an important step in making that transition. transition. When I think about the, you know, the investment the Chinese government is making in the yuan and, and whether that would challenge the dollar in any way, you know, going back to my point uh, earlier, it's, it, it's, just a, it's just a digital representation of, of it. That's it. It's um, the underlying mechanic, the underlying value, the underlying monitoring policy is all the same. So, so, so that doesn't change. But what might be a concern that many people have and, you know, is, is the level of oversight and monitoring that comes with a digital yuan. So um, in, in some ways, I'd say that, yes, it's got, you know, benefits by with it being digital and all in terms of settlement and remittance, etc. But at the same time, it gives the government more insight. And that's something that people won't might not be um, willing to to accept. So. I, I, I see this as an interesting development. I don't see it as something that threatens the, the global financial system. I, I think it'll, it's something that will stay within China. But I do think that, again, it will spur uh, innovation and activity in this space where infrastructure providers, wallet providers, exchanges will pop up to facilitate that. And, and that is the core infrastructure that can facilitate other uh, crypto, whether they be CBDCs or decentralized. That's very interesting. So you see these CBDCs more as a friend to Bitcoin rather than an enemy because it will help people move towards this adoption. Is that correct? I, I, I think so. So, you know, um, so, so let me ask you a question. I know you're sure. not going to be asking a question, but let me ask you a question. <laughs> a question but let me ask you, when you imagine a world in, in like, I don't know, 15, 20 years time, I don't see a version of it where everyone has transitioned to it. I, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a large part of the population that simply isn't willing to embrace Bitcoin and they, that their faith is in a central bank issued digital currency. So I, I don't see an outcome here where, um, you know, the entire financial system shifts completely to a decentralized currency. I think there will be cases where individuals and businesses would like a currency that's backed by a central bank or a, a political system or government behind it. For whatever reason, um, and I, I'm certainly so, so. One, I see a world, uh, and my question to you is like, you know, do, do you see a version where you think that we might entirely shift to um, decentralized currencies? No, definitely not. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. How that journey looks like is, I, I I think to take it mainstream, CBDCs will be a friend to the decentralized ecosystem. Ultimately increasing the size of the pie rather than um, yeah. and, and it will facil facilitate an adoption of decentralized currencies in the future where ultimately you'll, la you'll land at some sort of equilibrium where a percentage of the population holds their value in decentralized and then there's a percentage that trusts the CBDCs. That makes a lot of sense and the equil equilibrium also makes complete sense. Uh, very, very well put, Zishan. I really like that answer and it makes, hopefully it makes a lot of people think. And by the way, guys, if you have any comments on that, don't forget to drop them below so we can continue this debate and, and really learn from each other. Um, so Zishan, you mentioned something that was interesting in terms of this being a friend to Bitcoin. In your views, like what would be the most legitimate or, you know, stamp of approval for Bitcoin to actually reach mass adoption? Is it this, the CBDCs, the perfect transition? Is it the problem of quantitative easing? Uh, there are so many different views on what you think would make Bitcoin legitimate. Uh, I would love to hear your angle on that. I think Bitcoin's legitimate today. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> when, I, when I look back at uh, three and a half years ago when I joined Coinbase and some of the conversations I used to have with regulators, you'd be 
I, I don't think there was. I, I don't think there wasn't. I think the Bitcoin's use in the dark web wasn't brought up, and the conversation. And now the conversation is is so much more sophisticated. It, it it's about. It's not just about Bitcoin. It's about crypto assets in general, and actually, rarely does uh, criminal activity come up in these conversations. It's more forward-looking. It's more how do we um, how do we regulate this in some cases? How do we enable it in other cases? So, having had those conversations and and being where we are today, Bitcoin has very much shaken off, you know, uh, its roots as you know, something that's not used for legitimate purposes. Um, but then, you know, I I don't always, I don't ever just look at Bitcoin. I look at the crypto ecosystem in general, and I think we're we're really at the cusp of acceptance of adoption um, and, and actual use emerging. So, I I think we're already there. the The next phase is to um you know figure out how it fits in t- is to facilitate mass adoption how it, how it fits into your day-to-day um use cases and that's a really good point yeah so w- would you would you think that education is basically it's already legitimate so all we need is to educate people for people to understand the, the technology it doesn't it's not about the technology for a lot of people so for a lot of uh, so let me let me 5g is being rolled out in, in london and and you know you, you've got all these new 5g phones that are coming out and they're faster than say 4g and uh, the, the the new shiny phones have a higher refresh rate or, or whatever the new features are um so as a consumer you you look for what your benefit is do, do you upgrade to that phone what do you get from it do you save money is it is it adding value to your life in some way I think quite often the conversation around crypto is about the technology and how cool that is when when that's really not what matters to people and consumers. I think, you know, the average person would go, what does this do for me? Like, what what does it solve for me? Is there like a, can I, uh, there's a remittance use case. Can I send money to my friends in the US and they'll have it straight away? That's a real problem we could solve. So, um, I don't think when it comes to adoption, the conversation is about, look at this cool technology. I think the conversation is about, what can it do for you? And, and that's where you need partnerships like MoneyGram and XRP and Ripple that facilitate movement across border. I think that's where, when you start to deliver real value to people, that's when they'll start adopting it. And, and actually, I don't think even crypto will be part of that conversation. It'll be the underlying technology that's enabling it. But for a user, they'll talk about this great new way of, sending money or uh, this great new way of um, uh, storing their value, like like whatever the, the, the use case is. Yeah, that makes so much sense. I mean, especially you mentioned remittances and microtransactions, which is something which is a big problem, right, that we really need to solve, especially for, you know, emerging uh, markets and, and developing countries. So uh, that makes a lot of sense. So uh, next question is related to the UK. Zishan, obviously, you're you're probably one of the best people to ask related to this um, you know, a lot of people are debating whether uh, the UK and specifically London will become one of the crypto hubs or blockchain hubs. And also there are a lot of debates on whether Brexit itself is good or bad for crypto. And I would love to hear your angle as someone who's been living here and, and working here and, and being a part of this uh, local family. Totally. Um, you know, the first thing I'll say about um the, the current situation is, I think there's a lot of unknown unknowns at this stage, right? Um, we, um, the, the UK is, is at a bit of a crossroad um, and the events of the next 12 to 24 months will very much dictate which direction we head down and they could be completely opposite directions. Um, but I'm an optimist and there is an opportunity here for the UK to um, to, to take charge because what what is likely to happen is that we would no longer be part of the harmonized framework with the EU and can create our own financial services regulation. Um, I, I think in reality we will need to maintain some sort of equivalence with the EU simply because there's a lot of cross-border uh, trade and, and provision of services. But I think what the UK will have is is the independence to create new regulation, and and that's an opportunity which places like say Switzerland or Singapore have seized on, and 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 there's no reason why the UK couldn't seize on to create a crypto friendly framework here in in, in you know in, in the city in London and in the UK in general. 
um, because London London has always been the, the financial uh, the heart of the financial system, and I, I think with this this finance 2.0, this money 2.0 era about to begin, uh, there wouldn't be a better time than now to to ensure that London pivots and becomes the heart and continues to be the heart of this next generation of financial services. Um, you have all the building blocks there. You have um, an incredible talent pool. Um, you have all the infrastructure that you need to make that happen. So, um, you know, I, I, I think if we make the right decisions, I very much see London becoming a crypto hub, uh, leading the way in th this financial services revolution. That's a really good point because post-Brexit having this independence will fasten the process. Is that how you see it? Is like now the UK is independent and financially can, can set their own you know, rules to the game, which could accelerate uh, the process. Is that kind of how you're seeing it at the moment? I, I, I am. I mean, that, that, is, that is the opportunity that is in front of us, right? Because we, we will be uh, no longer bound to EU regulations. So, um, you know, uh, again, with my optimistic hat on, I would see us seizing that opportunity and creating regulation that's forward looking and embracing new technology like crypto. Um, so, so I, I, I do, I mean, I sincerely hope and, and, you know, we'll, we'll try and do our part to play, uh, play our role in that, uh, uh, in these developments is to take the UK to a place where it does become a, uh, a crypto hub. That sounds really interesting. And you just mentioned Finance 2.0. Uh, I would love to hear, obviously, it's very difficult to see the future, but um, what would the Finance 2.0 future look like to you? So maybe in one year from now, two years or three to five years, it's it's up to you. But uh, what are some roadblocks or as this show is called Kryptonites, you know, what is the Kryptonite that we need to break through in order to reach this Finance 2.0 world? So... Um... The, the financial system will look very different. And, and the reason why I say that is I, I think with the definition of money changing, all the services that are tied to it will start to evolve as well. Um, one example of that in my mind is what is a bank account in five years time? Is it um, is your Coinbase wallet a bank account because you can get paid in it and you can store the currency of choice with it? You can pay utility bills with it. You um, you can have, you can make your everyday purchases with it. And at that point, does the definition of a bank account change? Um, yeah. you, you could take a mortgage out with it. You could have a savings account there. So I think where we're headed is a sort of a redefining of some of the concepts we have around what money is and how we interact with it today um, and that's kind of you know what we're working towards as a business as well is um, in a world um, you know crypto is what infrastructure is needed what role do we play how do we facilitate the, these very diverse set of customers that we have ranging from retail customers on the one side to institutional on the other um, but I, I, I think in my mind, that is, that is a, almost a certainty in terms of where I think the world will be. Money will be digital and it will be centralized and it will be decentralized and your bank account will look and smell and feel very different to what it does today. Um, and, and how you interact with money will be very different too. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I think uh, Andreas Antonopoulos would agree 100% with what you're saying is finance 2.0 is your, your own bank or you directly have access to your old automated financial services. So uh, thank you so much, Jishan, for your time today. If people want to follow you or get in touch with you, I know you're telling me that you're not so active on social media these days, but uh, is there any way we can reach out or hear more information about what your views are on the crypto space? And Yeah, I mean, I, I tend to very rarely blog about um, developments at Coinbase, so Medium might be it. But other than that, um, LinkedIn probably might be a good way of connecting. LinkedIn might be a great way. And also in terms of the Coinbase crypto card, I, I know that it's been a great success here in the UK. Many people love the experience. If people uh, want to hear more about the, the Coinbase card and your offerings, so they just visit the Coinbase.com website. Is that the best place to go? The Coinbase Card website is the best place to go. You'll find everything you need over there. 
Um, it's something we continue to build on. Actually, there's uh, there's some exciting news about that coming out soon as well. I can't talk about it just yet, but it's um, it, it is another one of those projects which was about how do we make crypto accessible at the point of sale. Merchants aren't accepting it, uh, you know. So how do we um, how, how do we adapt existing payment rails and 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 allow people to access their crypto? So. Uh, that was a project that we, we pushed out from, uh, we launched here in the UK first, grew to the rest of Europe, and is, is something we continue to build on. So one of my favorite things that we do here. Thank you so much, Yishan, for coming in today. It was really fun talking about CBDCs, talking about different tokens, talking about Bitcoin, Brexit, and the many really, really cool topics. Thanks, Alex. All right, guys, don't forget to like comment with your views below, subscribe and blast that bell notification so that we can grow the community and enjoy these live chats premiering every Wednesday, eight o'clock BST at a computer near you. See you next week, guys.